All right. So, um, last, uh, so, so, so it's almost the last week, right? Technically, mon the next Monday is where we make up the day that was lost uh, at the beginning of the semester, right? So next Monday, we actually ha have a class, which um, will probably be a bit of a, bit, you know, Wednesday uh, going to definitely review, be review. I think today we're going to review a bit um, after we finish up the dispersion. Then we'll just start with new stuff for the semester. Um, last semester, recursive problems were on the exam as bonus points, so um, that's why I bring him, I'm bringing them up now. Because we don't necessarily, not every professor is able to get to them, but we'd like to be able to ask them, because even if you have learned recursion, you can figure it out. It's just easier if you're familiar with the concept. Um, so what we went over last time was, was one of the first things uh, one of the very first uh, methods you might learn when you're doing recursion. So we're going to go over some more recursive sequences. This does mean that we're going to unfortunately have to subject you to more math because um, a lot of math equations end up being recursive definitions, right? We had this, uh, you know, so we started out with factorial, which, you know, was that n followed by an exclamation point. And we said that basically n factorial was n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 and all all the way down down to 3 times 2 times 1. Uh, so fa 5 factorial was uh, 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And the idea of recursive definition is that we would redefine each problem as a smaller version of itself. So 5 factorial, which was 5 fa times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, well, we looked at that 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 and said, wait, that's... 4 factorial, so 5 factorial is 5 times 4 factorial. 4 is, sorry, 4 factorial is 4 times 3 factorial. 3 factorial is 2, sorry, uh, 3 factorial is 3 times 2 factorial. 2 factorial is 2 times 1 factorial. And we go all the way down to what we call the base case, where it's no longer defined as a, recur in, in, as a recursive definition. You just kind of, kind of return an answer, which is zero factorial. And we say that z that the definition for zero factorial is one. Okay. So um, our recursive definition is simply saying that if we have n factorial, that's equal to n times n minus one factorial if n is greater than one, sorry, greater than zero. But if n is n factor but if n is zero, we'll return one. Right? Zero factorial is one. So that led to this equation, I'm sorry, to this function, where we said public static long fact, for factorial, public static long factorial takes in an n if n is equal to 0. So if we're at the base case, we're going to return 1. Otherwise, we're going to return n times n minus 1 factorial. And surprisingly, this works, right? This looks like we'd get into an infinite loop because each factorial function all, uh, calls a factorial function. But we start at n, the next call's at n minus 1, and the call after that's n minus 2, and the call after that is n minus 3, and so on and so forth. And eventually, we hit n is equal to 0, which is the base case, so we'll stop calling the function. So for, so factor, so recursive problems to review have two parts. They have what we call the base case, which is the super simple case that we can just simply give you an answer without having to make a real easy, a real hard decision about it. Okay. The other case is the um, is the recursive case where we redefine the problem in terms of a very easy part and a smaller version of the same problem. So factorial was zero factorial for the base case, and the recursive case was n times was n, right, that was the super easy part, and the smaller problem was n minus 1 factorial, right? n minus 1 factorial is smaller than n factorial. Let's take a look with, uh, with another example for math, uh, the power function. So, the you know, x to the nth power, right? So, for instance, you know, 2 to the third, right, that's 2 times 3, you know, that's uh, 2 times 2 times 2, which is 8. 
you know, 2 to the 4th power is um, 16, right? You know, and 2 to the 5th power is twice that, right? Definitely should know your powers of 2. Okay? So, now we could, now this ends up also being a recursive definition. Now, why is that? Well, because remember the power function when we do an exponent, when we say x to the nth power, we're saying that basically that uh, this is equal to x times x times x times x dot 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 times x times x where x is multiplied together n times, right? So as a result, we can do, we can, re we can also redefine this, right? 2 to the 5th is equal to a bunch of 2's multiplied together. 2 times, it's equal to 5 2's multiplied together, right? 16, uh, sorry, uh, 2 to the 4th is 16, which is 4 2's multiplied together. And hopefully you see where I'm going with this, with, uh, you know, 2 to the 3rd being 3 2's multiplied together. So 2 to the 5th is equal to 2 times 4 2's multiplied together, which is 2 to the 4th, right? And 2 to the 4th is 2 times 3 2's multiplied together. Right? 2 to the 4th is 2 times 2 to the 3rd. Uh, 2 to the 3rd is 2 times 2 squared. Right? And so on and so forth. Everybody see how that works out? How this is now, how this is a recursive definition? We're redefining it in a smaller part. So what's our base case when we do recursion in this? When we, when we, when we do multiplication, sorry, when we do exponents. What, what is a super easy, uh, you know, nth power that we can do. Like x to the nth, what, no matter what x is, if I were to give you this power, you could tell me the result. Sorry? Zero. Zero. Two to the zeroth power, right? x to the zeroth power is equal to any, is always equal to one. So that seems like a, a really good base case. All right, so we can now, so so we've got a base case, which is basically x to the 0th power is equal to 1. All right, so x to the nth is equal to x times x to the n minus 1 power if n is greater than 0. But otherwise, x to the n is equal to 1 if n is 0. OK. Public static. Um, let's go with long again. Public stack long. Well, I'll need a double here, actually. Public stack double. Pow is equal to where we've got the um, where we've got some in it where we've got some we'll deal with just integers now int base to int exponent right we've got base and we've got an exponent right if the exponent is equal to zero then we if the exponent part of of a problem is equal to zero we we always need return one right right Anything to the zeroth power is one, so that's a pretty good base case. Otherwise, we're not in the base case, so we'll define it recursively. Base to the exponential power is equal to base times pow base exponent minus one, right? 
So, for instance, if we passed into the fifth, we'd be returning uh, two times two to the fourth. So, let's go ahead and try this out. Sout uh, pal. Let's go ahead and, and say two to the fifth because we know that. That should be giving us 32. And we get that just fine, right? We say uh, 10 to the sixth. That gives us a million, you know, as we'd expect. All right. So let's see. What about a negative exponent, though? What would happen if I put in, uh, you know, 10 to the negative first power, right? That should result in 1 10. What will happen in this case, though, where I pass in 10 and negative 1 as my arguments? Well, let's trace it. If I don't need to run it to figure this out, I can look at the code. If is negative 1 equal to 0? No, it is not. So we go to the else case. Return 10 times uh, this 10, you know, 10 raised to the negative second power, which is negative two is negative two equal to zero? No, it's not. So this will return 10 times uh, 10 raised to the negative third power, and so on and so forth. So that will just that doesn't seem to be working, right? If I if if I enter in a negative exponent, that will give me uh, you know, an infinite loop. Technically, you give me a stack overflow error because eventually it'll, it'll crash saying that I had gone too deep into my recursion. And you can go like, I think on my computer I'm able to go like 8,000 steps deep or something. So, um, well, how do we fix that? Well, we have to introduce what do we do if n is less than 0. So n to the, so x to the nth power is equal to what if n is less than 0? What is that equal to? So if I, so x, so let's look at 10 to the negative first power. What is that? 10 to the negative first power is what? 1 over, 1 over 10. 10 to the negative second power is 1 over 100. 10 to the negative third is 1 over 1,000. Right? If you remember, that means that basically it's equal to that x to the nth power, where if n is negative, is equal to x to the 1 over x to the nth power, but we got to flip this on. So we'll do that there. So if exponent is less than zero instead of uh, instead of going we'll we'll catch that case instead what we'll do in that case is that we will return 1 over power right so the base isn't ever going to change what's changing is the exponent now exponent is negative right now and we need to flip it so multiplying it by negative 1 will multiplying that exponent by negative 1 will basically change the negative exponent into a positive exponent and now the algorithm will work. So now if I run it, it'll give me 0.4 on 10 to the negative first power. It gives me 0 0.1 because it will calculate the positive exponent and then give me the reciprocal of that. Everybody see how that works? <coughs> so Recursion is kind of this useful tool where you can catch all these cases together and patch them together. It makes it a lot. You can imagine that this would be a bit of a headache if you were doing this, you know, in an iterative fashion. If you were using a loop, you'd have to have a bit of a different case. You'd have to have some, uh, a lot of different cases for what you were doing, a lot of code blocks. So let's see. So, 
Do we have do we have Euclid's algorithm here? All right. So let's see. One more example from math, and then we'll get into some computer science problems that we can solve with this. So Euclid's algorithm is a bit of a famous one that's recursive. Uh, the Euclidean algorithm is the method for computing the greatest common divisor. Um, and it's fairly straightforward. It's, uh, let's see, just trying to figure out, there we go. So, let's see, actually, let me pull up the slides I have on this one. It's much better if I, if I open up these slides. So, Kaufman. This is an example I give in data structures. All right. So, um, so just so we're on the same page, uh, computing the greatest common uh, divisor or greatest common denominator, that's what it, they called it when I was taught it, uh, of two numbers is the largest int that divides both numbers, right? You probably had to do this a bunch of times. Were you ever, like, taught an algorithm on how to do it, or did you just, like, figure it out because I think most of us were just told the problem and just said just divide by stuff you, you, you know factor these out and figure out which one of these have you know what's the largest shared factor essentially um, so for instance the greatest common divisor of 20 and 15 is 5 because that's the largest number that divides both of them uh, you know 10 divides 20 but it doesn't divide 15 cleanly the greatest common divisor for uh, for 36 and 24 is 12 because 12 divides them both cleanly. 24 doesn't cleanly divide uh, 36 and and it, uh, but it does cleanly divide itself. The greatest common divisor of eight, 38 and 18 is 2. And the greatest common divisor of 17 and 97, well those are both prime numbers, so the largest number that divides both of them is 1. So the algorithm, so we actually do have an algorithm a pretty clever algorithm, uh, which is given to us in generally in basically the standard esoteric math terms. Given two positive m integers m and n, m is greater than n, if n is a divisor of m, then the greatest common divisor is n. Otherwise, GCD of m, m n is GCD n m mod n. I think the only way they could have made this worse to write out was p and q is if they use p's and q's. Um, m and n is terrible for reading out loud because they sound the same. Uh, and p's and q's are terrible for uh, reading and out actually reading an algorithm silently because p's and q's look the same. They look very similar. <laughs> Especially when, you know, they're, you know, next to each other. Which you never see in English, but always will see in math. Okay, so um, fortunately we actually are in a programming language, which means we have the option of using, you know, more than one letter for our variables, which is kind of what we need here. So public static uh, int gcd. I'm not going to call these m and n. That's confusing. Uh, int big, int small. Okay, so you've got two numbers, a big and a small. Okay. Um, okay, and we're going to assume that the first one is uh, is big and the second one is small. So if um, so, the first thing we need to figure out is basically does the smaller one evenly divide the bigger one, right? For instance, like if we're given if we're given fifteen and five as our if if our big number is fifteen and our small number is five, right? If five cleanly divides fifteen. Then, uh, there, then five is the common denominator, common denominator of both, right? That's kind of the base case here. So if big mod small is zero, return uh, small because that's the greatest common denominator. Um, else we're in the recursive case, which says that basic 
And the recursive case is actually quite interesting. It says the greatest common denominator of big and small is equal to um, small big mod small. Now this is actually quite interesting because oh and I need the uh, GCD operator over here. Now this is quite interesting. So first off the recursive case is it doesn't seem like straightforward as the other ones, right? If it was the other cases were like we if we hit zero we're done. And over here we're saying uh, small you know as big and then the new small will be big mod small, and it doesn't seem obvious that that will get us to zero, right? But when we take a, a number, so we've got a number over here, small, and then we're taking another number, big mod small. So let's just analyze that for a second. Uh, small is a number like maybe is maybe a number like 15, okay? If we have a number like, uh, and if we have a number over here, big mod small. If we mod something, say, by 15, then the only values that we can have are that are going to result from this are 0 through 14. By definition, it's going to be smaller than small. Okay? That makes sense? Any number modded by small is going to be smaller than small. It's going to end up either being 0 or 14. So this is going to end up being smaller no matter what. Right? And if these things happen to be equal, then they're going to be able to divide each other, in which case we get a recursive uh, thing. Um, and if this number divides uh, this number, then we've hit our, our base case. And if they don't, well, then it's going to get, then this value is going to get even smaller. And eventually it will hit 1. Right? Eventually it will hit 1. If it hits 0, we return. And if it hits 1, well, return the next step because everything is divisible by 1. So this will eventually end. So let's see this in action before we run it, just to, just to kind of show you. So we've got our big number, our small number, and big mod small. Let me go ahead and increase the text size so that everybody can see. Or actually, is there a way to enter presentation mode? Ooh, that looks good. OK. Big, small, and big mod small. Okay? All right. So let's say we're trying to figure out the G uh, greatest common denominator of, let's say, um, hmm, let's say 54 and 18. Let's see, not 54 and 18. 63 and 18. Okay. Is 63 d cleanly divisible by 18? No, it is not. Okay, so what we're going to do is that we're going to compute big mod small. So what is 63 mod 18? That's actually a bit of a challenge to just do in your head. So let's see. So 18 times 2 gives us what? What's 18 times 2? That would be like 36, right? And let's add another 18 onto that. That gives me uh, the, from 36. So adding 4 from 14 gives – sorry, adding 4 from 18 gives us uh, 40. Adding 14 more gives me 54. So 54. Okay. And then what we end up – and how – and what's the difference from – distance from 54 to 63? Right, so 18 can go, can divide. If we do 18 divided by 63, uh, we'll get th th sorry, 63 divided by 18. That will give us three. What so? What's the remainder going to be? Well, it's 63 mod 54, which would be nine. Okay, so that means the next step of the algorithm, 18 is going to be uh, big. Nine is going to be small. Now, is 18 cleanly divisible by nine? Yes, it is. So we return nine. Okay. What about this one? Let's go ahead and see uh, 55 and 15. Okay. Another similar thing. 55 and 15. Does 55 cleanly divide 15? No, it does not. Um, 
what we get when we uh, divide 55. So now we have to compute 55 mod 15, which ends up being 10. Because remember, 45 is the, it, uh, you know, 15 can go into 55 three times. That will leave you a remainder 10. So 15 and 10 for the next step. Okay, 15 versus 10. Uh, does 10 cleanly divide 15? No, it does not. So we got to compute uh, 15 mod 10. And that's pretty easy. We just take the last digit, 5. Does 10, is 10 evenly divided by 5? Yes, it is. So we return 5. All right, so let's grab two prime numbers now and see how this algorithm works out. So, or at least two co-prime numbers. So let's go with... Um, Let's say, uh, I'll go with two co-prime numbers first. So let's go with, uh, yeah, 15 and 8. So is 15 evenly dividable by 8? No, it is not. What do we get as a remainder when we do 15 mod 8 then? 7. Is 8 cleanly divisible by 7? No, it's not. So what is 8 mod 7? So what it is 7 cleanly divisible by 1? Yes, it is. Everything's cleanly divisible by 1. We hit our base case. So we return we return uh, 1 because that's the smallest number that divides both of them. Does that make sense to everybody now, see, after seeing it in action, how, that this worked? It's kind of incredible that it works, but it just works off of the fact that uh, we're essentially eliminating uh, you know, divisors. All right, so um, let's see. So let's go ahead and try this out on like 36 and 12 uh, GCD. So that brings us, uh, gives us 12. Uh, 101 and 11 should give us 1. Right, nothing too scary about this. All right. So, yes, obviously recursion can be used in math. And I actually do have one more example, which is, the, which is actually, so recursion, it looks like it's this beautiful tool that obviously you should use all the time. Well, I'm going to show you uh, a case where it's actually not great to use it. It's actually the first recursion of recursive function that almost everybody's taught, but for some reason, or at least I was taught when I was taught recursion. It's probably a good idea that you don't teach it this way. So uh, I'm going to start typing out a sequence. Uh, first number of the sequence is 1. Second number of the sequence is 1. What's the next number of the sequence? 2. What's the next number? 3. What's the next number? 5. 8, 13, 21, right? This is the Fibonacci sequence, right? What is the Fibonacci sequence? It is that each term is the previous two added together. Now, this is unlike the other one. I think the reason we use this as a, as a recursive definition is because there's pretty – this is blatantly a recursive definition, right? The nth Fibonacci number is equal to – the n minus 1 Fibonacci number plus the n minus 2 Fibonacci number, right? It's the last two Fibonacci. So the nth Fibonacci number is equal to the last two Fibonacci numbers put together, okay? And now if we um, – now what do we do, uh, do? What can we do? Um, we can uh, – all oh, right, we need base case, right? So fib of of one is equal to fib of zero. So if we call these first two Fibonacci numbers the zero Fibonacci number, fib of one is equal to fib of zero, which is equal to one. Okay. So we can write a pretty easy uh, recursive definition for Fibonacci. Public static long fib int n 
right? If n is less than or equal to 1, return 1. Else, well, it's equal to return the fib of m minus 1 plus the fib, the n minus 2 Fibonacci number, right? It's equal to the sum of the previous two Fibonacci numbers. All right, so that's going to work just swellingly. All right, so sout um, so system out the print line. Let's print out fib. So let's print out the tenth. Uh, let's go with the fifth Fibonacci number just to print it out, just to show that it works. The fifth Fibonacci number is eight. That makes sense. One one two five. Eight? Hmm. One, one, two. Less than or equal to one. Return one. So, oh, right, because this is the zeroth Fibonacci num number here, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five. There you go. And so we can print out the 10th Fibonacci number pretty well, as well, too. Um, we can print out the 40th Fibonacci number. No problem. What? Oh, that's the 140th Fibonacci number. That's not going to work. Um, 40th Fibonacci number. Print out the 40th Fibonacci number, and we get that pretty quickly. What about the 41st Fibonacci number? Oh, it seems to pause a bit there. 42nd Fibonacci number. Okay, what about the uh, 50th Fibonacci number? And my computer's working on the problem. It's actually going to take a couple minutes if it finishes at all. Because um, our recursive uh, method is not that great. In fact, it takes a long time to do. Uh, when you take math concepts two, I think, maybe one, you should learn about big O notation, right? Uh, I don't, so how many of you are taking math concepts one, right? Did you learn about big O notation in math concept one? Then you'll probably learn in math concepts two. Okay, you'll also learn it in data structure. But what I've done here is I've accidentally written an exponential function. Um, meaning that this will take a long time to do. But in English, oh, there, the there it popped out. Now if I increase the this n from 50 to 51, it will take twice as long about for, for this to solve. Now why is that? Well, it's because of the, na the way I wrote this recursive function. And to put it bluntly, it's just not saving its work. Right? I'm going to calculate uh, the 50th Fibonacci number, which is going to require me to calculate the 49th and the 48th. To calculate the 49th, I need to calculate the 48th and the 47th. To calculate the 48th, I need to calculate the 47th and the 46th. To calculate the 46th, I have to calculate the 48th, right? So see how I've repeated the, I have to calculate the 47th and the 48th a couple times there, right? I'm not saving my work at, at any point during this. So each time I have to calculate the number, I have to calculate the unit. So here, when I finally finish the uh, 49th branch, right, I've calculated the 48th and the 47th. And then I have to go and redo all the work I just did for the 48, right? And basically, you can think of this as a tree, basically. You can think of this as a tree because that's what it is. Oops, sorry. Uh, okay, so here I'm computing the 50th number, which requires me to do the 49th and the 48th. The 48th. 49 requires me to do the 48th and the 47th, right? The 48th uh, requires me to do the 47th and the 46th. The 47th requires me to do the 46th and the 45th, right? All these method calls you just basically keep, you know, I have to keep redoing work over and over again, right? Right? This 47th is going to have to do the same work as this 47th. This 48th is going to have to do the work as this 48th. That makes sense to everybody? I'm just redoing work all the time with the way this works. So this isn't great. Now there's a couple ways we can get about this, right? I said this is 
I said that this is a symptom of us not saving our work. So we could. T so one possible solution is something called memoization, which you actually don't necessarily learn in 2168. Um, and what that does is essentially we'll create an array that we pass in as an argument, right? So one array will be shared among all the answers. And what we'll do is that we'll just store the answer if we've kept, if we've computed it. Right? What well, that would look like is something like this. Int r. Okay. Um, and what that will do is that it will pass this along and this along. Um, else. If, um, let's see. If array n minus 1 is not equal to 0, right? 0 is the default value. So if it has a value in it, then let's say that int um, m minus, so we'll have an m minus 1 equals 0, int n minus actually yeah array n minus 1 array n minus 2 and let's see What's wrong here? Oh, right. Int. Essentially, we can check for our answers. Actually, let me just go ahead and pull up what I already have rather than trying to write it again. It's not too important, but I do want to show it to you. How do I get out of this um, exit presentation mode? There we go. Let's go and look at projects, classroom, data structures, code, recursion, recursion examples. We have two numbers. If it's already in there, if it's already there, we grab it. Otherwise, we calculate it and store it. And if, so for each of the values that we would have, if it's already there, we just grab it. If we haven't computed the, the nth minus one Fibonacci number yet, though, we calculate it and then we store it for later use. Does that make sense? So that's kind of the idea of this one. All right. So let's go over what the classic 1068 problem is, though, for recursion. Okay. So, and I started getting into it last uh, lecture, but I wanted to do, I wanted to give more recursive examples first. So suppose we've got a list of numbers, right? Now, if you're looking for a number in, in just any old list that's not sorted, there's only one way you can do it. That is, and that is that we have to basically iterate through the list until we find our item. We have to, if the item has n, sorry, if the list has n items in it, then we have to uh, search through all n items. In big O notation, we say, or in algorithmic complexity, Sorry, when we talk about something and how long that takes, we say it has a time complexity. We say that this time complexity is O of n. So we would say that it's that searching an array, just going through it one item at a time, takes O of n time, which means that it's on the order of n time. Basically, if you have n items in the list, it's going to take about n steps or maybe two n steps or maybe three n steps, right? It's going to take basically a certain number of operations for each item, which is basically I'm going to look at the item and compare it to the, if it's the item I'm looking for, right? I'm going to do that for each item. We call this linear time. You'll learn more about it in, in 2168 in Math Concepts 2. But for right now, just simply know that this is pretty, it's actually a pretty good time, but it just means I have to look at every item in the array. And that's what you have to do if the array is unsorted. But if the array is sorted, we can actually speed up 
how quickly we need to find something. And we're going to do that by playing a game. Okay? So I am thinking of a number from 1 to 100. I am thinking of a number. I will hide it behind the projector so that I don't cheat. Okay, I've hidden my number behind it so that I can't cheat. Okay, um, so I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100. So you can guess the number, and I will tell you if my number is higher or lower or if you got it right. Everybody's played this game before, right? It's not really a fun game, but let's see. Uh, so what's your first guess? 50, right? Everybody's going to guess 50. Why are you guessing 50? How much does it reduce the, uh, the, the your search space, let's call it? It, it reduces, yeah, it cuts it in half, 50%. Okay? So uh, my number is higher than 50. So now what do you know? It's got to be between 51 and 100. Yes, what's uh, 75. 75. Why are you choosing 75? Because it, takes half away of that. because it takes half away of that. Excellent. So if you choose 75, my number is higher than 75, by the way. That means that basically you know that basically by guessing 75, you split the space up into two sections. 51, or well, three sections. 51 to 74, right? And then uh, 76 to 100, right? Those, and then the, your actual guess, which was 75, right? It's got to be in one of those three sections. It's either got to be lower or it's got to be, uh, you know, higher. Right? And it's higher. So now our section is 76 to 100. So now what? What do you guess? Somewhere halfway between 76 and, uh, and 100, right? Right? So what is between 76 and 100? Let's see. So you've got four. So you've got essentially 24, right? Numbers between 76 and 100. So four plus 20, right? So 12, so you probably want to get something 12 more than 76. Yep? 88. My number is smaller than 88. So now you know that the search range is between 76 and 88. Okay, so now we need to find a halfway point between 76 and 88. Sorry? 82. My number is higher than 82. So now it's between 80. So now you know it's between 83 and 88. My number is higher than 84. So now you need to know. Now you know it's between 85 and 88. Yes. Is 86? My number is smaller than 86. 85. My number is 85, as a matter of fact. See? Told you, I'm not going to cheat on this game. My number is 85. So, what you just did there was actually a recursive algorithm. You took the problem, and then you reduced the problem into a smaller state, believe it or not. That's a recursive algorithm. You said, because what's a, because there is an equally valid solution that just takes longer. I'm thinking of a number between 1 and 100. 1, it's higher. 2, it's higher. 3, it's higher. 4, it's higher. 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right? And so on and so forth. That is a perfectly valid solution for getting the, for getting the answer. It's not going to get you the answer. Uh, unless somebody's chosen something in the single digits, it's not really going to perform that well. But it is a valid algorithm. But by using this recursive algorithm, the idea here is that we uh, split our space into half with each step, right? We chose 50, then we chose 75, then we chose what? 82? 86, 86, 88, right? And that helps split it in half, basically. Each time we split it in half. So um, I'm going to put up a term on the board that basically probably makes you shriek with error because you don't really know how to compute it off the top of your head. Right? Even though, and that's because you know your math teachers probably didn't have a good idea of how these things worked anyway. Right? Log. 
of n, right? Now, as computer scientists, uh, we aren't working in log base 10 anymore. Okay, if you're in log, if you're if you're in computer science, we don't care about log base 10. Okay, when you see log in a computer science class, it is okay to automatically assume that the log we're talking about is log base 2, and that's easier than log base 10. Okay, because logarithms, right? You remember, if you remember, they're like some weird equation having to do with exponents. That's a bunch of crap. There is no weird exponent relationship if you're trying to calculate logs very easily. Right? If you want to calculate logs very easy, it's all about how many times you can split something up. That's what it is. Log base 2 asks you, how many times can I split something in half? That's what log base 2 is. For example, log base uh, 2 of, so log base 2 of 8, okay, what is log base 2 of 8? Well, it's the number of times I can, you know, you could figure out, okay, so log base 2 of 8 is x, right? And you might try going, okay, so 2 to the x minus, sorry, 2 to the x is equal to 8, solve for x, right? You could do it that way, or you could do it a bit more of an intuitive way, which is ask, how many times can I split 8 in half? Log base 2 asks how many times I can split something in half. So I can split 8 into 2 piles of 4, right? And I can split those 4s into 2 piles of 2, and then I can split those 2s into two, all those 2s into 2 piles of 1, right? So I can split this in half, I can split each of the 4s in half, I can split each of the 2s in half, and once I hit 1s, I can't split them in half anymore, right? You can't split 1s in half, otherwise we're going to end up with deficits, we're going to end up with doubles. So how many times can I split something in half. So I can split 8 in half three times. That makes sense to everybody? So that's your easy kind of solution to, have, uh, to a logarithm. Go to what a log base 2 is. Uh, 64, right, we can split those in half into 32s, those into 16s, and those into 8s, right? So 2 to the 6 is, you know, so that should be 2 to the 6, right? Yeah. 2 so 2 to the 6th power is 64, right? Because we can split 64 in half six times, right? So if log base 2 is how many times we can split stuff into piles of 2, right? Two equally sized piles of 2. What is log base 3 then? So when I say log base 3, if you're using the same type, under the same analogies, what is this split? What is this in splitting stuff? If log base 2 is splitting stuff into halves, what should log base 3 be? Sorry? Thirds, right? Log base 3 is just how many times can I split something into thirds as opposed to halves. Log base 10 is how many times can I split a pile into tenths, right? That makes sense now if you look at, like, log base 10 of 100, right? 100 can be split up into 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, into 10 piles of 10, right? And each of those 10 piles of 10 can be split into ones, right? Now, mind you, this really only work, this kind of definition of splitting really only works if we're dealing with like stuff that's evenly divisible by logs, or evenly like split up, right? Doesn't deal with like, so it only deals like with the clean solutions. It doesn't deal with like when you have to deal with like, you know, n to the 1.7, right, kind of deal. Right? It doesn't deal with that kind of stuff very well. But it gives you a much better mental model of what logarithm means. And the reason I bring this up is that our algorithm for sorting a binary, for searching a binary list, is big O log base 2 of n, as opposed to searching through something iteratively, which is log, which is O of n. Again, more you're going to learn. And that means that basically we, so O of n meant we had to search um, every item in the list. And in log base 2 of n, what we're going to do is that we're going to basically split, um, we're going to search as many items as there, as, we're going to search as many items at, equal to the number of times we can split it. In other words, we're going to do what we did for our, um, in order to search a sorted array, 
instead of just going through it iteratively, what we're going to do is that we're going to look at the middle of the array and basically say, okay, is the number we're looking for higher or lower than our number? And then we're going to look in the middle of, of the array after that. Make sense to everybody? So let's write that up. And this will be blazing fast. Public static int. So it's going to give me, it's going to return the index of whatever we're looking for. Okay? It's going to return the index of whatever number we're looking for. Uh, search. I want to search this int array for int target. And I'm going to overload this function. Um, this is something you typically see in, in recursive methods so that people don't accidentally start in the middle of recursion. What it will do is that I will uh, have this call, I will overload this function. So we had overriding, which is basically when you're inheriting something, right? When you inherit something, you can override it, it, your behavior from your parent. Overloading is where you have two methods that are that have the same name but different signatures. In other words, so I'm making this one a private static int search, and it's getting more variables or different variables. Array target first. So int first, int last. In other words, the first in this and this will be the indices that I'm searching between. Okay. That way, basically, that uh, and the reason it's private is that so you know whoever's searching it doesn't mess up. So return negative one, and here this will simply return. So I'm having this method, and this is a very common thing you see with recursive methods. Uh, I'm going to search the array for the target. I'm going to start at index zero, and I'm going to search. And the last element, and the last index in this is array dot length minus one. Right? Makes sense. I'm searching between these indices. All right. So now I'm going to search this array, uh, and I need a base case and a recursive case. And the base case here, um, it's not entirely obvious, but we'll go with basically uh, if the last item is less than the first item. In other words, if my first, if my right first is on, is you know first should be less than last, right? The smaller indices should be bigger, uh, should be smaller than the bigger indices at the end. And if they crisscross somehow, then I know I'm done. And I'll return negative one to say I couldn't find it. Else, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to check the middle item of the array. So how do I compute the middle item of the array? Um, it's actually not too bad. Int middle is equal to, let's see how much time, what time is it? 154. So if I'm trying to compute like the middle of this array, right, zero, I mean, let me run through this example on this. So you've got one, two, three, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you've got one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine elements in this array, right? So there's nine elements in this array, and say we're trying to see, ask ourselves, does is 52 in this array, in this sorted array, which we know is sorted? So the first thing we'll do is that we'll look at the middle item, which is at index four, right? Zero and eight, then the middle index is going to be four. So we look at, at and ask ourselves, is 52 bigger than the middle item? If it is, because this is sorted, we know that 52 has to be on this side of the array. So it's got to be between one of these four items. And so we look at the middle item of this, which will air to the side of the left, and we'll say, okay, is 52 bigger than 9? Yes, it is, so I, can, so I will search this subsection of the array. So I look at the middle item, which will be 52 in this case, and say, is 52 bigger or smaller? Well, it's equal to, so I found 52, I'm done. That makes sense to everybody? So the way you compute the middle is to take the first, L, it's equal to first plus last divided by 2. That's how you compute your, your middle section. Now, a common mistake I see when people do this 
is, and, and by I see, it's mean, I, a common mistake I've seen myself do, is do this, first plus last divided by two without the parentheses. And the issue with this is that I messed up my orders of operations where I do last divided by two plus first, which can often result in really weird stuff. So you want your order of operations to be correct. So first plus last divided by two, that will give me an integer. So now I want to say int middle value is equal to uh, array middle. If uh, target, if the item I'm looking for is less than the middle value, sorry, if the target, if the item I'm looking for is equal to the middle value, then I'm done, right? I found the item. Return middle. That's where I found it. Else, um, so if the target is greater than, sorry, is less than the middle value. Well, then I need to search the left half of the array now. I need to search um, every. I need to search basically everything that comes before the middle of the array. So search. So in that case, I'll return search the array or the target. And since I'm searching the left half, the first item, you know, stays in place. And what changes is the last item. And I'll search first to middle minus one. Right, because we just saw, looked at the middle index. So we're going to look at everything from the first index to everything that uh, up to the middle minus first. And if it's not equal to and it's not less than, then the only other option is that it is um, greater than. So we'll return search or the array for the target from, from, the, uh, from the middle plus one to the last item. I know I went a bit quick there. Um, all right, so 11.58. So that is our binary search algorithm. And notice that it's also a recursive function. But this is how basically if you have an, uh, but this is built into the arrays, and this is built into the arrays class, by the way. Arrays dot, two, um, dot binary search. You know, a you know, an array for this value. All right. So that's essentially everything I want to go over for 1068. So congrats, you've made it to the end. So let's talk about uh, preparing for your exam. Okay. The final exam is going to be prime. If it's anything like last semester's, and I have seen no reason why it's going to be any different than last semester's. It is going to be a bulk of multiple choice problems. Now, fair warning, the, um, now, fair bit of warning, the uh, exam is going to be brutal to you, um, uh, in the sense that basically I think last semester's average was like 60 on the exam. Um, and this is cohesive with the, you know, this is, um, sorry, this, this is consistent. This is consistent with the last with what we saw in you know the semesters before that. So um, now there's a couple reasons for this. The first is that it's uh, is that we've got basically a lot of points in, uh, stacked into reading code, right? Because uh, we have a bunch of multiple choice questions. Okay. Now this means since they're multiple choice questions, there's essentially not an easy way to get uh, partial credit on them, right? So that's that. So that's one source of the, uh, of uh, you know the reason why why the scores can be low on that. The other reason is because it's you know a final exam and you've had other things to study for. So that's another reason. And the third reason is that because the final exam takes place basically a week after our last class, so there's kind of a deterioration. So you should definitely take this one seriously, even if you've been doing well so far, right? Um, so about like I think it was like last semester, 58 of the points were um, were you know were were reading code, and 42 of the points were writing code. You know, so um, if for some reason you need you cannot take the exam, 
You need to like contact me ASAP. Like if you can't take the exam on on uh, the eighth, and you know you can't, like because you have plans to leave the country, you need to contact me ASAP so I can give you a sec a separate exam. Okay. Um. You know, so that basically you don't want to get a zero on this final exam. Um, if something comes up unexpected, also email me as soon as you, as soon as possible, so that we can uh, so that we can arrange to take care of it as soon as possible, or arrange an incomplete. Right? An incomplete will only be able to be arranged if you've actually been doing well in this class so far. Right? I can only do that if, and I can't do it like as a favor to a student. That there has to like literally be there has to be documentation for an incomplete, like. You know, uh, like, fu like, you know, go, having to leave because of a funeral or because you had to go to a hospital or stuff like that. So, um, so if you have to miss the exam because of like a because of a because of a reason like that, um, just know that you'll have to make it up at some point, probably during the summer semester with the TA. If they can arrange it, or in the fall semester, which can really mess up your scheduling. Okay. Um, so, how do you prepare for this exam? Um, well, um, honestly, my best suggestion is doing something like this. Intro to programming, final exam, and then right-click on the examples and start working through them, which is what we'll do in, in class. Uh, now, some of the stuff will have stuff like you've never even heard of, and that's fine, because, again, it what's intro to programming in one class won't, might not be an intro to programming in another class. But um, but this one, like saying which line contains errors, what's printed by this block of code, you know, these this is this seems like a pretty good example. So keep uh, keep note of that URL up top that will be and that will be uploaded, right? Um, Evaluating expressions right here. This one deals with something called turtle graphics. Um, this one's done in Python, but I mean, some of the problems for writing them, those still work. Um, let's see. This one, uh, you know, this program prints five lines of output, right? This one's actually a pretty nice one. And typically, like, you can find stuff, uh, the solutions for these final exams, if you, let's see if this one follows the typical pattern. Nope, it doesn't have soul, but access forbidden, let's go, spring 18, exams, right, you can typically go and look at, uh, at, uh, at exams from other semesters from other schools, like this one's from UPenn, right, so there's tons of stuff at this point. Um, that you would be able to uh, rely off of. So that's oh here they have a it's sol, it's dash sol n, right? So you, but this but so a lot of these have a lot of these things have answer keys to them. And if it's not something you're familiar with, don't worry about it, you know, because then it's probably something that we didn't go over. So there's a lot of sources out there, and if you need to narrow it down to Java, what you should do is just add Java over here. And if you really want it to make sure you get PDFs, add file, colon, PDF, and voila, you now have PDFs. You, your, all your results are now PDFs. So there's a lot of um, you know, good resources there. Documents. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Exam teaching. I think I might actually have a practice final. Let me check. Do I have one? I think I'll double check. I might have a practice final. If I do, I'll give one to you guys. But otherwise, you know, you'll have to rely on, on your skills to basically look up stuff and prepare, and prepare. Uh, especially like reading stuff, that's where you'll probably want to prepare the most, but also don't neglect to write stuff. Um, you want to be able to read, uh, specifically you'll want to be able to work, uh, write 
So specific things for writing that have been on the exam in previous semesters. For writing, you definitely want to uh, be able to write methods that handle uh, you know, double arrays. So in, in other words, a matrix of integers or possibly a matrix of strings, right? So you want to be able to handle that. And you want to be able to write a class much like the Pentagon class, right? So uh, we typically don't do anything much more advanced than a geometrical shape, and we just basically and we give you pretty basic instructions on how to do it. We tell you write these integers, you know. So we tell you to, you know, like write, uh, you know, we might tell you a square, you know, to write a square class, like, you know, write a, you know, create a private instance variable to represent the side of the square. Create a constructor, a single constructor that takes in the, uh, you know, the side of the square and sets it. You know, write a get side method, write a set side method, and then write a compute area method, given this and give you the equation for for that. Like no, that doesn't sound too too much harder than the Pentagon thing, right? That so that's fairly straightforward. Also, um, ten sixty eight, right? I think uh, Dr. Fiore has stuff on his webpage too. Um, so he's got all of his in-class files. He's got his um, slides. Let's see. Um, let's see. And let's see. I don't think he has anything this semester for practice material. But um, oh, he's got some practice midterm problems over here. And some other practice midterm problems from so problems from uh, so he has problems from uh, from the first midterm that are multiple choice, and he has some uh, other problems that are multiple choice. Actually, and they're quite extensive, so I would try I would try them out. And since he's the one writing the exam, it would be in your best interest to go through all these problems and make sure you can do them, right? You know who's writing the exam, and the person writing the exam gives you practice pro has practice problems listed. You can be sure that they're going to be very similar. To the exams are actually given out in class. So we'll start by going. We'll start going over reviewing stuff on Wednesday. Um, our last session will be on Friday for lab, and then on Monday we'll have, you know, we'll figure out what to do Monday. Maybe I think we'll, we might take more time to review. I might take some time to show you some other interesting stuff that you can do. Otherwise. Uh, you know, let's start reviewing for, for our final exam.